Hello, and welcome to the Sentinel Innovation and Method Seminar Series. My name is Rishi Desai. I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology at the Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. I will be moderating today's session with my colleague, Michael Mathieu, who is an associate professor, professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics, Medicine, and Biostatistics at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. The US Food and Drug Administration's Sentinel system helps to address questions related to the safety and effectiveness of marketed products. The Sentinel Innovation Center focuses on developing innovative methods to further advance Sentinel by leveraging new data sources, building new tools, and enhancing real-world evidence capabilities through advanced analytics. The Sentinel Operations Center focuses on supporting the FDA in use of Sentinel Common Data Model and associated modular programs or tools to gather evidence to support regulatory decision-making. The Sentinel Operations Center also maintains the FDA's Active Risk Identification and Analysis or ARIA system. The session for today is titled Synthetic Data to Support Reproducible Clinical Research Opportunity and Challenges. We are very excited to host our three invited speakers, Dr. Randy Foraker, Dr. Khalid Al-Imam, and Dr. Brad Mullin who will be speaking about their experiences with synthetic data in the first half of this presentation. After that, I will briefly summarize Sentinel Innovation Center's interest and plans for using synthetic data in future. Finally, we will have a moderated panel discussion, which will be moderated by Dr. Matheny, where panelists will answer all the questions. I'd like to mention that your lines are muted. So if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session, please type it into your Zoom question and answer feature and Dr. Matheny will read them out for our, our panelists. Finally, I would like to mention that this session is being recorded and will be made available through the Sentinel webpage, which can be found at sentinelinitiative.org. With that housekeeping items, it is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today, who is Dr. Randy Forker. Dr. Forker is the director of uh, the Center of Population Health Informatics at the Institution, uh, Institute of Informatics and a professor of medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Forker also serves as director of the Public Health Data and Training Center for the Institute of Public Health and director of the Center for Administrative Data Research. Dr. Forker specializes in the design of population-based studies and integration of EHF. EHR data with socioeconomic indicators, as well as use of synthetic data for research. Her recent research has focused on the application of clinical decision support embedded in EHR systems to, to complement risk scoring in primary care, cardiology, and oncology. So with that, I will pass the mic over to Dr. Forker and welcome her to the series. Thank you very much for the invitation to present today. The topic that I'm going to cover is around how my team and I have evaluated synthetic data for its utility. So what I mean here is we've conducted a series of statistical validations of synthetic data both locally at our institution and then also nationally as part of the National COVID Cohort Collaborative that we're a part of. And so I'm going to go through some examples of the work that we've done in each of those contexts to give you an idea about the types of use cases that we've evaluated and where synthetic data are particularly useful in terms of giving us the same answer that we would see if we had used the original data and where this particular type of synthetic data may not meet um, a researcher's needs in a particular use case. So that's what I'm going to be walking through today. Um, first, I wanted to tell you that all of these examples are coming from our interaction with the MD clone platform, which is a self service tool for building queries and extracting the computationally derived data that you need in order to conduct your analyses. And I'm going to start off by presenting what we've done locally at Washington University in St. Louis and direct you to some of our publications so that you can get a more in-depth look if you're interested in, in going a bit deeper into those use cases. 
First of all, I wanted to give you context around what types of data are loaded into the local instance of MD clone at WashU. The clinical data are collected during the course of clinical care at BJC Healthcare, and the Institute for Informatics maintains what we call a research data core, which is essentially a copy of the health data core of the clinical data to be used for research purposes. It's those data from the research data core that are loaded into the MD clone data lake, which can then be accessed via the query portal of the MD clone platform and data are computationally derived from that platform and exported um, as a CSV file for the researcher to work with. And each row of data in the CSV file is a unique patient, um, and each column are the variables that the user extracted from the MD clone system. It's important to realize that in the process of computationally deriving these data, it goes beyond data de-identification. There isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence between the synthetic data output and the original data, meaning there's not a patient named Jim Smith in the synthetic data derivative like there is in the original data. And all of the correlations between the variables are maintained in that output data set. So this is how we can get the same answer from the computationally derived data as the original data. So what we did at WashU before we decided to adopt the MD clone platform for research and, and education purposes at our institution is we wanted to conduct use cases along the translational spectrum. So we took a bioinformatics approach where we looked at very high density data predicting head trauma severity in the pediatric ICU. We incorporated bed alarm data, um, which is very dense. We incorporated lab values and vitals and so forth in our analyses. The second use case was really uh, clinical informatics driven, and we tested machine learning models for evaluating sepsis risk among inpatients. And then finally, we took a population health approach and conducted geospatial analyses and compared rate differences in sexually transmitted infections um, by zip code and by year. We wanted to make sure that we were seeing the same geospatial patterns as well as temporal patterns in, in these data. So I will direct you to our Spot the Difference paper if you want to dig into the details of these three analyses that I just gave you a brief overview of. Um, we've also used exclusively synthetic data in analyses. And what this paper did, it wasn't a comparison of synthetic to original data, it was using just synthetic data on about 27,000 heart failure patients to predict one year mortality. And what we did in this paper was evaluated different deep and machine learning approaches for that prediction. We wanted to see which model performed the best. And this paper is also published. So if you want to know um, all of the details about what we did with the data, um, you can certainly look into this particular publication to find out more. Now, the other context in which we've evaluated synthetic data is in the National COVID Cohort Collaborative. So the NIH maintains an instance of MD clone in support of research done with the N3C. And for those of you not familiar with the N3C, it is a partnership among 70 plus institutions across the United States who share their electronic health record data with the NIH. Um, and it's all related to COVID. These are COVID positive patients and we can evaluate things like 
patient trajectory and epidemic curves, which I'll get into a little bit um, in our statistical validation work. And these data are available as a limited data set, uh, but then also they're loaded into MD clone so that end users can access the computationally derived version of these cohorts that they build in N3C. And so I'm just going to walk you through the use cases that we have explored nationally using this data resource. And I just want to point out that one of these papers is already published. One of them is forthcoming and is available as a preprint. Um, and so this is the first one that I'm going to just very briefly walk you through. Again, we chose three use cases that were relevant to the N3C community in order to perform this statistical validation, this comparison between original and synthetic data. The first thing that we did was um, we mimicked a cohort paper that had already come out of the National COVID Cohort Collaborative in which they described the patient population that was currently participating in this initiative. And so what we did was we compared those data distributions of demographics and medications and lab values and vital signs and we put them head to head in terms of comparing their, their averages, their standard deviations, the counts, percentages, the data. And we saw that the computationally derived data told the same story as the original data. The next thing that we did was um, evaluated machine learning models for the prediction of admission among COVID positive patients. So here we trained and tested the models on the original data, and then we trained the models on synthetic data and tested them on original data to make sure that again, we got the same story using both of those approaches and, and that the performance metrics were similar um, using those two approaches. And then finally, we wanted to ensure that using synthetic data could also maintain time dependent relationships in the data. So as most of you know, um, the limited data set does not contain granular dates. So when you think about constructing an epidemic curve using a limited data set, you'll realize very quickly that that isn't possible. Um, so we compared the original data um, with the synthetic data for the construction of epidemic curves just to ensure that it maintained these spatial, spatial and temporal relationships. The second paper that's currently a preprint um, and will likely be out soon delved a bit deeper into those geospatial and temporal analyses that I just mentioned. And we got very specific in terms of analyzing epidemic curves by zip codes. And we explored densely populated zip codes and compared those results and the precision in those results with that of lower population density zip codes. And what this did was highlighted a key limitation of synthetic data, at least as they are produced via the MD clone process. And that is, if there aren't enough patients like them in the original data set, those data cannot be computationally derived. And so data are censored. This isn't to be confused with censoring in survival analyses. This is actually hiding the value of a particular data point um, because that particular string of data in the original data set is sufficiently rare and there are not enough patients like them in the original data set in order to be able to generate a synthetic data derivative in that particular very unique strata. So what we saw when we delved deeper into this geospatially 
is that we encountered problems with suppressed data in small zip codes, in small in terms of population zip codes. An interesting byproduct of this and a realization that we had is that um, when you're presenting data, for example, for public health purposes, you also are supposed to suppress those low counts of diseases within a geographic area. So the, pr the process of generating the computationally derived data using MD-clone does that for you. So it suppresses those rare um, outcomes in those smaller zip codes. So you can look at that as a, as a benefit or as a barrier to using synthetic data for this purpose. And then finally, um, we presented this particular work at the American Medical Informatics Association meeting last week. And so this is hot off the press. Um, what we wanted to be able to do here is to predict a peak in regional caseloads if a peak existed and not predict a peak if a peak did not exist. And we used um, emergency department data from N3C for these analyses. And you'll see that the, the figure on the left shows, um, oh, and we used a delayed elasticity model for this particular work. And you'll see that the data that we use to train the model is shown in the light blue dots in the left-hand figure. And the test data are shown in dark blue dots in that left-hand figure. And the top graph corresponds to Massachusetts and the bottom graph, North Carolina. And you'll see just from these dots, just from these cases, that um, there is a peak in Massachusetts and there isn't one in North Carolina. Then moving to the figure on the right, here's where we wanted to be able to predict that inflection point. And you see that the actual inflection point or lack thereof is shown in the dark blue line and the predicted inflection point or lack thereof is shown in light blue. And so we were able to use synthetic data um, to be able to predict these peaks where they existed and not predict a peak where they didn't exist. So overall, I've told you about the work that we've done locally at WashU and then nationally with N3C. And what we've observed is that synthetic data can help researchers get valid results um, over a short period of time. And what I mean by that is at WashU, once you have access to the MD clone platform, you can log in, build your own query, and generate a computationally derived data set within minutes. Um, and our institution has ruled that synthetic data, at least produced using this method, no longer constitutes human subjects research. So you also don't have any sort of regulatory steps getting your protocol approved by the IRB before you can log in and generate these synthetic data and do your research. And then um, I've concluded here by saying while protecting patient privacy. And I know that we're going to get into that a little bit later today during the webinar. And so I just wanted to mention here that at WashU, um, we underwent expert determination for the process, for the algorithm itself within MD clone. And so that expert determination was done. And then in N3C, we're, we're working with the same data sets that we used for the use cases on that first paper that I told you about. And we're trying to see through an adversarial approach whether we can re-identify an individual in the computationally derived data set. So those privacy analyses are currently underway and I don't have anything to share with you at this time, but we should have um, 
something available and ready to report as early as spring of next year. And lastly, I just wanted to emphasize that while we find that the statistical validation work that we've done to date has panned out, and you get the same answer from the computationally derived data that you do from the original data, that doesn't mean that it's going to work um, just so and just right in every single context for every single research question. And so drilling down into your data, doing some gymnastics analytically, and continuing to conduct these statistical validations is really important. And on the other side of that coin, of course, we should also keep evaluating the privacy preserving aspects of these data. And the other thing that I'll mention, and I'm sure that I'm preaching to the choir here, particularly with those that have used electronic health record data, is that don't be surprised if your synthetic data are messy because the original data are too. So I'm just calling out here that um, the synthetic data generation process doesn't fix that messiness in the data. So any data quality issues or any inherent biases in the source data are passed along to the synthetic data. So you also have to be aware of those limitations in this work. And with that, I am going to conclude and stop sharing my screen. Thank you all. Great, thank you, Dr. Forica, for that uh, wonderful summary of, of your work, very interesting work. Um, I am now pleased to introduce our second speaker for today, who is Dr. Khalid Al-Imam. Um, Dr. Al-Imam is the Canada Research Chair Tier 1 in Medical AI at the University of Ottawa. He is a professor in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health. He is also a senior scientist at the Children's Hospital in Eastern Ontario Research Institute and director of the Multidisciplinary Electronic Health Information Laboratory, conducting research on privacy enhancing technology to en enable the sharing of health data for secondary purposes, including synthetic data generation and de identification methods. Dr. Alimam is co founder and CEO of Replica Analytics, a company that develops synthetic data generation technology. As an entrepreneur, uh, Dr. Dr. Alimam founded or co-founded six products and service companies uh, involved with data management and data analytics, with some having successful exits. Prior to his academic roles, he was senior research officer at National Research Council of Canada, and he also has served as the head of the quantitative methods group at the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. With that, I will pass this along to Dr. Alimam. And uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can see your screen. Thank you. If okay. You can there you go. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you very much. So, um, what uh, I plan to present to you uh, now over the over the next fifteen minutes or so is to give you an overview of some of the uh, techniques that can be used to uh, um, generate synthetic data and also give you an overview of some of the uh, considerations or some of the issues that come up in practice, uh, at least some, some of the key ones that, that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, encountered. Um, and I'll give you a perspective on the, um, the achievements and the, and the challenges with, uh, with synthetic data generation. So to start off with, let me um, give you uh, kind of an High level picture of, of how synthetic data gener is generated. So, uh, a basic model for that is you have some kind of machine learning uh, modeling technique, which is a generator um, that is used to generate synthetic data. Uh, the approach we have taken is the generated takes as input the original or real data, but there are other ways to do that. Um, you can provide the generator with random values, but uh, uh, as, as, as an alternative, and I think uh, Brad will, will talk about that later on. But in the approach we've taken, um, the generator takes as input real data. So you train a machine learning model, um, and then the generator produces some synthetic data. You have some kind of uh, discrimin discriminator function, which uh, tries to tell the difference between the real and the synthetic data. And then uh, that produces some uh, 
some metric, uh, some loss function that is uh, fed back to uh, train uh, the generator or to tune the hyperparameters uh, for that generator. Uh, we use this called uh, machine learning techniques and deep learning techniques um, for the generator. And uh, for the discriminator, there are a number of uh, approaches that we have used as well. Um, some of them are uh, binary prediction models, uh, but there are also other approaches for comparing multivariate uh, distributions, which, which can work quite well in practice. So depending on the type of data, the, the actual nature of the discriminator will also depend and I, uh, will also be uh, chosen. And I, that'll be a theme of, of my talk is, it depends on your data. Um, so the, uh, the nature of this, these evaluation results, uh, which, is, which are is essentially um, utility metrics, uh, is very important and they can have a big impact on how well your synthetic data generation uh, uh, setup uh, works. Um, and we've been doing a number of um, large scale evaluations of, of different uh, utility metrics. Um, and it turns out that uh, a lot of utility metrics um, are, well, you'd want a utility metric to be predictive of workload. So for example, if you're going to do a survival model, then you want your utility metric to be predictive of how well your synthetic data is going to perform on a survival modeling. If your synthetic data is not going to uh, produce meaningful results on your survival model, um, then you want your utility metrics to be able to, to anticipate that. Um, and it turns out that a lot of utility metrics don't. Uh, they, they don't have a good relationship between the metric itself and, and performance on uh, kind of common workloads or common uh, statistical modeling uh, uh, problems. So you have to choose your, your utility metrics carefully so that you're optimizing on the, on the right criteria. Um, simultaneously, you want to also uh, have uh, privacy metrics. Um, so ideally, you would uh, then measure the privacy risks of your synthetic data and combine that um, with the utility metric and feed that back to improve your generator. Uh, the reason, of course, is you, if you overfit, if your generator overfits to the data, to the real data, then your synthetic data will be great, but your privacy risks will be very high. So ideally, you want to optimize on both of those, maximizing the utility metrics, which should be predictive of realistic workloads, and also minimizing on the uh, uh, privacy risks. And I'll talk a little bit about the privacy risks uh, later on. Um, so that's the basic setup for... Uh, a, a synthetic data generation tool. Now there are two types of uh, synthesis strategies that, that uh, we have applied, uh, partial synthesis and full synthesis. There are different variants of partial synthesis. So I'll show you this one, uh, which is focusing on privacy. So in a data set, uh, you, you have um, uh, typically would divide the, the the, the variables in your data set into quasi-identifiers and sensitive variables. We're, I'm assuming all the direct identifiers have been removed or encrypted or pseudomized. So I'm not gonna worry about those. So the quasi-identifiers are the variables in your data set that can be attacked, that can be used for re-identification attacks and then everything else is essentially your sensitive variables. So partial synthesis with the uh, intention of privacy protection would result in uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the synthesis of only your quasi-identifiers. And, and then you keep the sensitive variables uh, intact. Um, and so this, this works well in practice. It's privacy protective in the sense that you are perturbing your quasi identifiers and, um, uh, and then you can always measure the privacy risks um, afterwards. The, uh, this approach works, uh, looks similar to the traditional data identification, but it works better than traditional data identification because with, when, when you use synthetic data generation techniques, you also model the correlations among the quasi identifiers and between the quasi identifiers and the sensitive variables. So your data utility will be better. With traditional data identification, you treat each one of the quasi identifiers independently. So there's uh, a little bit of a utility lift using synthetic data generation and, and this setup. Um, but uh, but it, in, in, in essence, it, it's, it's somewhat similar to traditional data identification. With full synthesis, you synthesize the, the whole data set. It's more privacy protective in the sense that the privacy risks are smaller. And the main advantage or the other advantage of full synthesis uh, 
is that it's largely automated. So you don't have to classify your variables into quasi identifiers or sensitive variables. Uh, you can just synthesize the whole data set. <clears throat> so the, the amount of skill needed to perform the task is, is reduced in the sense that you don't need a skilled person to, to determine which variables are quasi identifiers and think about you know, inferred quasi identifiers and so on. It's, it's, uh, um, it's a scale that, that, that uh, folks need to, to learn to, to do well. So with synthesis, there's more, full synthesis, there's more automation. There are other reasons why you may use partial synthesis versus full synthesis. Sometimes the data sets are so complex uh, that partial synthesis is the only practical way. And this sometimes shows in clinical trial data sets where you have this uh, concept of rel rec tables, which are uh, defining uh, re relationships among, among individual records across tables. And, and these are essentially unique relationships, which are really difficult to model. So there are cases where partial synthesis makes sense just because of data complexity um, as well. Uh, and then the other scenario where partial synthesis makes sense is when your data sets are small, uh, as with any modeling problem, you need a, a, a enough uh, observations uh, per the number of events or per the number of variables in your data set. And if your data sets are small, you may not hit those thresholds. So in that case, you reduce the data set by using partial synthesis to be able to uh, model properly. So your generator has enough information to actually build a good, good uh, generative model. So there are a bunch of reasons why partial synthesis would, would be suitable for a particular data set, uh, but they're always trade-offs between privacy, practicality, and so on. But as a practical matter, uh, being able to do both is a, is a plus because uh, as you encounter different types of data, you will uh, want to have the, uh, enough tools in your toolbox to, to be able to synthesize uh, appropriately uh, and get good results. So there's always this trade-off between utility and privacy. It's kind of a classic trade-off in, in the uh, uh, disclosure control community. Uh, so if you try to maximize privacy, privacy protection, you minimize your utility. And if you try to maximize your utility, you're minimizing your privacy protection. So it's a trade-off and you try to find a suitable point along this line. Um, where you, you have an acceptable um, uh, trade-off. And it's the same thing with synthetic data generation. If the objective of synthetic data generation is, is uh, to produce non-identifiable data and, and data sharing, which is, is our focus today. So here, uh, I'll just talk a bit about privacy protection. I'll talk about utility. I mentioned that the utility metrics that can be uh, used uh, that can are, are predictive of workloads. But of course, if you are able to run realistic workloads on your synthetic data, then that gives you uh, uh, the clearest answer about your, uh, your your synthetic data utility. So I'll focus on that just because of time. I won't be able to go through all the different types of um, utility metrics. So from a privacy perspective, there are two models that are typically used uh, that that make sense for uh, for evaluating uh, synthetic data privacy risks. So one we'll call it the identity disclosure model. Um, essentially, looks at um, the ability to match a synthetic record with a person in the real world. Um, we always say that uh, there isn't a one-to-one -one mapping between a synthetic record and a real person, uh, but sometimes these mappings do occur by chance. Um, and uh, they also occur if your generative models overfit, and they also occur if your data set consists of uh, categorical variables, and these categorical variables have uh, a few uh, 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 possible values, response, a small number of response categories, and therefore your, your just domain of possible values is small. And so the chances of your synthetic data replicating original data, real data, or, or replicating values from people in the population becomes high. And the difference between the real sample and the population is very important because the real sample that you're using to, to train your generative model uh, it's not the whole population, it's a, it's a subset of the population and really you're concerned about matching synthetic data with the population. Um, and in that case, you also have to worry about two directions of attack. So you can match someone in the real world uh, with, a, with a record in the synthetic sample and you can match a record from the synthetic sample with a person in the real world. So we built a model to evaluate this risk and uh, it's a two-stage or a two-step uh, model. One is what's the likelihood of a synthetic record uh, matching uh, someone in the population? And then conditional on that, uh, would you learn something new about that person if you got a match? Uh, 
um, and because all the sensitive variables are synthetic, uh, you may match on the quasi identifiers, but you may not learn anything new or anything correct about the person because the whole data has been perturbed and therefore the information gain is very small uh, because of, of the perturbation in the synthetic data. So there's a model that can be used to, to evaluate this. Uh, and uh, based on some of our experiences, here's an example from a study we did and all the references are at the back of the deck. Um, we used the Washington State Hospital Discharge Database, um, and we evaluated the, the uh, this privacy risk, its identity disclosure risk using this model, uh, and then the, the Canadian COVID-19 uh, kind of public health data set um, testing database. And you can see the, the, uh, the uh, risks from the fully synthetic data are quite low. Um, and we typically use the 0.09 threshold, which is... Um, a value used by the European Medicines Agency and CMS and Health Canada as a threshold for what's deemed to be acceptable risk. So it's a, it's a value with some with some strong precedence, and um, uh, we show that the fully synthetic data set using our our um, statistical machine learning technique um, is is below that threshold. And I think based on all the studies we've done. And, as long as you don't overfit and the data set is not trivial in practice, if, if synthesis is done well, uh, the, the identity disclosure risk, um, in the way that I've described it, tended to be to be low. Um, and then the other type of um, privacy risk is membership disclosure. Um, and the typical way this has been evaluated is shown in this picture. Uh, the idea is whether uh, if you have an individual, whether that individual um, and adversely can determine if that target individual is in the training data set, which is the real data set that was used to synthesize. I think uh, Brad will talk a little bit more about this, uh, but the, the, the current method is, is essentially to simulate an attack uh, by splitting the original data into a holdout data set and a training data set, and then use the holdout, um, the, um, the combined holdout training and try to match it to the synthetic data to see uh, if you're able to detect which records are in the holdout versus the training data set just by looking at the synthetic data set. So if you're able to determine that a person was used in the training data set, then you, you learn membership. And if the, if the data set pertains to a particular disease, um, then, then you've learned that uh, that target individual uh, has that disease because they're likely to be a member of the training data set. So that's the privacy use case. There are other use cases relating to copyright infringement and so on that are relevant in other domains with membership uh, disclosure or membership inferences. But in our case, really, we just, if you know that someone is in a training data set, you may learn something about them because the whole training data set pertains to particular disease or condition. Uh, so there's another uh, a model for privacy evaluation for membership disclosure. So both of these uh, tests, the membership disclosure and identity disclosure can be used for uh, uh, privacy evaluation. So now I'll just show you some results. Um, I'll talk about uh, longitudinal data. And again, the way you synthesize uh, tabular data versus longitudinal data is different. So um, tabular data is essentially uh, <clears throat> a single table. Um, and so this, this example here is comparing real and synthetic data sets for a phase three colon cancer clinical trial. <clears throat> and uh, the objective here was to model um, bowel obstruction and look at the uh, uh, relationship with disease-free survival over five years. Uh, so this is a, a, a Cox proportional hazards model. And uh, <clears throat> there's about 1500 uh, patients in this, in this particular data set. And you can see the parameter estimates and the 95% compass interval um, for, for each one of the parameters. So a couple of things to say here, uh, the original data set is, is longitudinal, it's a clinical trial. So one approach to deal with longitudinal data, which is shown here, is to query the, the longitudinal data set and extract the tabular data, synthesize the tabular data, and then do your analysis on the, on the tabular data. And as you can see, the confidence interval overlaps are, are high and the parameter estimates are quite closed. And really for our purposes, that the main uh, hypothesis around bowel obstruction and uh, the parameter estimates are very close and uh, compass intervals have high overlap. So the adjusted uh, results for bowel obstruction in this model are quite concordant between real and synthetic data sets. The other thing I will mention is, um, you know, synthesis is a stochastic process. Uh, 
<clears throat> and so that stochasticity introduces additional uncertainty into your model. So you have to adjust for this additional uncertainty uh, in order to get valid inferences uh, from uh, from your models. So uh, so uh, especially when, you, when you're building uh, you know survival models or regression models, uh, you have to uh, make the adjustments for you know correct compass info coverage and correct power, etc. Uh, when you do that, the, the results are, are encouraging in the sense that there's strong concordance between real and synthetic data. So here's a, another, another scenario where you are uh, modeling or synthesizing uh, uh, longitudinal data. In this case, we don't, um, uh, we don't build a cohort, but we synthesize directly from the, uh, the, the longitudinal data set. So in here, this example, we have five domains, a demographic table, and then five different tables on drugs, visits, admissions, labs, and claims. And then we use a deep learning model or current neural network to synthesize this data set to recreate the, uh, the, the events that occur over time. And so time dimension, of course, is very important because you use previous observations to predict the next observation in the sequence. And uh, so you have five, it's very heterogeneous data set in the sense you have five uh, different uh, types of uh, events. Um, and each event has a different set of attributes and um, each patient can have an arbitrary number of events as well. So some patients in this data set had, you know, a um, small number of tens of events so across, uh, uh, across multiple years and, uh, and other patients had thousands of events. They have 180 in, in patient, uh, number of events per patient. Um, so we, we modeled this as well. And the objective here was to evaluate, uh, uh, to focus on opioid users. And this is a, a data from the province of Alberta. So it's a single payer system. So we're able to get all these data uh, domains and, and integrate them. Um, so we looked at, uh, again, uh, um, Cox models, um, prediction of uh, this time to event analysis, prediction of ED visits, uh, hospitalization, mortality, and uh, particular diagnosis, pneumonia. So I can, as you can see, uh, the adjusted risk ratios and the adjustments are shown on the left-hand side for all these different models are, are show strong concordance between the parameter estimates and the 95% compass infos between the real and synthetic data. Top one is the real, but se um, the second one in each uh, plot is the, uh, is the synthetic data set. So the results are encouraging. Again, uh, here we modeled the full uh, sequence, uh, longitudinal sequence of, of the data set rather than uh, querying it and and extracting a cohort. So different different ways of modeling uh, data set depending on how you want to share them and how much you know in advance about the analysis that you want to do. So the last example I will mention is uh, relational data that's not longitudinal. Uh, so this is the FARS database with the drug adverse events. And here it's a, essentially a hierarchical data set and uh, uh, it looks like longitudinal data, but it's not because there's no time. There's no time dimension uh, uh, among the different uh, 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 observations uh, because individuals uh, may have uh, multiple uh, drugs for their adverse events. They may have multiple symptoms. Um, and uh, it's you're not trying to predict an event based on the historical sequence of events anymore. Uh, you're really trying to model hierarchical relationship. And for that, uh, a different techniques are also needed to, uh, to build them synthesize this data set. So, so you have three different approaches then for, for uh, synthesis of, of uh, 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 relational data. One is if it's longitudinal, you can define a cohort. Uh, actually, you can define a cohort also if it's relational and non-longitudinal or uh, you can model the longitudinal data directly. And if there's no time dimension, you need a different set of techniques to model the hierarchical relationships among the data sets. And then you have the full and partial synthesis uh, approach. So all that to say, you need a toolbox of techniques that can be applied to different types of data sets and choosing the right technique is important. Privacy models exist, by the way, the privacy of synthetic data. So I think at this point, it's really, there's no reason why privacy assessments cannot be done using, uh, using these models. Um, I think that the simulations that have been done so far show that they produce uh, uh, pretty good results in terms of, of accuracy. Uh, and there are some pretty good uh, population estimators for those. 
Um, and then in terms of utility, I'll leave that for another day. Uh, utility metrics are another topic, I think, that, that requires additional time to cover. So with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Dr. Alimam, for that that great uh, overview of your of your work. Very, very interesting, very relevant to, to the type of thinking that that we have here. Um, so, with that, I will uh, introduce the third speaker for today, who is Dr. Brad uh, Bradley Mullen, is uh, Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He's also the Accenture Profes Professor of Biomedical Informatics biostatistics and computer science. He founded and co-directs the Health Data Science Heads Center and NIH Center for Excellence in Ethical, Legal, and Social Issues Research on Genomics, Medical Records, and Privacy. He's one of the PIs for the infra, uh, of the infrastructure core of the new NIH AIM AHEAD program, which is working to establish mutually beneficial and coordinated partnerships to increase the participation and representation of researchers and community currently underrepresented in the development of artificial intelligence and machine learning models. He's a, he is currently serving as co-chair of the Committee on Access, Privacy, and Security for the All of Us Research Program in the US uh, Precision Medicine Initiative, and is an appointed member of the Technical Anonymization Group of European Medicine Agency. He's an appointed member of Board of Scientific Counselor of the National Center for Health Statistics and CDC, um, and among various honors, he's also an elected fellow of the National Academy of Medicine. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Uh, Dr. Malin. Thanks, Rishi. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I also wanted to point out that Khaled's also a member of the Technical Anonymization Group, so I'm not completely special. Um, so, okay, so we've had some really good presentations from Randy and Khaled, and uh, they said uh, some of the things that I'm, I'm going to say. So um, I've tried to redefine my presentation a little bit on the fly uh, to try and address some of the things that, that we're seeing and contextualize them. So I've, I've called this little short talk, Synthetic Health Data, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and, and I think you'll see why in a second. All right, if we can move forward. Okay, so um, I just want to clarify that there are several different ways in which you can generate synthetic data, and we've, we've seen uh, a little bit of an introduction into what these are, but I wanted to provide a little bit more of a foundational perspective um, and, and philosophical perspective on, on what these are. So the first one is, is what's referred to as a perturbation approach. And, and in a perturbation approach, what, what you have is a, is a set of records that you're beginning with. And these are the records that are of interest um, that an organization like Vanderbilt or, or WashU would have, would have collected. And that's considered private information. And so you subject it to some type of a function when we're just gonna call this a perturbation function. Okay, and then you're gonna create a public version of these data. And what you're doing with perturbation is you're manipulating the data. You are noising it, you are potentially generalizing it, but you're doing something that changes what that, that data is. Um, and so you generate various representations uh, with respect to each of the records in your underlying data set. Um, and, and Randy alluded to this when she was talking about the notion of creating a one-to-one -one relationship between the underlying data and the data that goes out the door. Um, and so perturbation is, is kind of what we've done for a, a long time. Um, this, is, this is the typical way in which standard de-identification models have, have been developed over time. Um, the alternative, and, and what we're talking about here today is, or what a lot of us are talking about is, is a simulation-based approach, where in the simulation approach, you're, you're taking each of those underlying records, you're feeding them into a model that you've, you've learned or you're, you're training, and then you're gonna simulate off that model. And off of that, you, you may end up generating records that have the look and feel of the records that were in the underlying system, though they're not necessarily exactly the same. Um, but you hopefully have learned something that is sufficiently generative so that you can simulate records that you may have never seen before. Uh, but these records are consistent with your expectation of the way that the world could work. And therefore you can use this for any type of an analytic process or review that you're going to do with the data. Uh, and so you're, you're in this situation, the, the data, because there's no one-to-one -one mapping uh, with the underlying system, you're, you're hopeful about two things. One, you're hopeful 
that it, it's actually representative of, of the environment you're trying to simulate, that you're trying to represent. And you're also hopeful that there's no relationship between what you've generated and put into the public domain and, and in the underlying private system to, to invert what's going on. Okay, so, so what, what we've been talking about a little bit, uh, but we've tiptoed around this, is, is this notion of generative adversarial networks, which, which have come into vogue um, starting about six or seven years ago uh, in the machine learning community. And, and Colette alluded to this in, in the picture that he had, but I wanted to give a little bit more of a walkthrough of how this works in that you basically begin with your real data and then you, you subject it to a model, you send it to a model, typically what would be the case now would be a deep net. Um, and then off of that, you pass that model over to a generation process at, at which you generate the fake data. Now, at this point, you then send out to another deep net, which you're gonna call a discriminator. And you will send data that is unknown to the discriminator. So it's not gonna know if it's receiving fake or real information. Now, when you propose fake information, you hope that the discriminator comes out and says, uh, a, a, a discriminator could say fake, right? Now, it could also say real um, if you provide it with real information. Um, it could also be a situation where you provide it and it says real. Um, and it could also, when, when that happens, right, that's when you want to, if, if, if it's discriminating well in this situation, it's, it's not discriminating well, but when it's discriminating well, then you're going to provide feedback to the underlying network and you're going to say, hey, Tune, I want the fake data to look more like the real data. And so this happens when you have both types of errors, right? So you can have fake and fake, you can have fake going into real. Okay, this, this notion of using these, these nets to play against each other to create a model that makes the real data look very similar to the fake data and vice versa. Um, this, is, this is not a new principle as I was alluding to. Um, so back in 2014, Ian Goodfellow introduced how to do this with, with imaging data, which, which really made a lot of sense because uh, there's a lot of correlation within the pixels that you can see and, and you can, humans can visually determine whether what they're looking at has the look and feel of like the original image or, or an image itself. Um, and you can see that over time, and this is a, a great tweet from Ian uh, that shows that over time, our ability to do this in the imaging space to generate fake information using this adversarial learning principle has worked really well, okay? Um, now, I, I also wanted to point out that this notion of synthetic data generation is not really all that new with, with deep learning. Um, and, and it goes back easily to the 1980s and 1990s um, in the statistical community um, and the analysis of, of structured administrative data sets. It, it, it really came into vogue when Jerry Ryder started uh, publishing on this in, in the early 2000s. And so I would encourage you to take a look at the evolution of this work in, in this community, which goes back to 2002. Jerry then had a, a, a follow-up paper where, where he said, okay, so now that we know how to generate synthetic data, we can now evaluate identity disclosure risks like what Khaled was alluding to. This is a paper that came out a couple of years later in 2009, uh, and then a little bit more recently, um, talking about um, what happens when, when you're trying to do not just fully synthetic data, but what happens when you're trying to do partially synthetic data. Um, with, with our own work in this space, uh, it dates back about, about four or five years. We started this work back in, in 2016. Um, this was through a collaboration with uh, Jimeng Soon's group, uh, who was at Georgia Tech at the time, now at University of Illinois. Um, and in a partnership with Buzz Stewart and John Duke, uh, we, we started by uh, checking to see if the GAN principle could, could work for structured health data. And so um, we took data from, from Mimic uh, as well as data from Sutter Health. And, and we just tried to model the demographics and the structured diagnoses and medications that these individuals had and to test to see if it, if it was working. We didn't have a specific problem that we were trying to simulate, we were, we were really trying to see, could we get the look and feel overall? So given a set of information, could we predict if an individual had a particular diagnosis or a, um, or a procedure? Um, and so what you're looking at here is basically, it's, it's similar to what, what a QQ plot would be, 
where on the, the y-axis you, you see what happens with, with real data, and then on the x-axis you see what happens with the synthetic data, and you see various types of simulation strategies. So um, what you see with um, over here with the VAE, that's a variational autoencoder, um, you can see that works pretty well. In the system that we developed with a GAM, works even better. This is your typical, my line is better than your line graph. Okay, so, so we, we demonstrated that this could be done, um, and, but what were the limitations? And so one of the things that we learned was that when you include autoencoders, which, which was the, the standard way of doing uh, a lot of the, the deep net building at the time, um, you, you would end up inducing noise and, and this, would, uh, this would hurt your learning code. So it wasn't perfect. Um, the other thing that we noticed as we were doing this was that um, the evaluation measures that we created and other people had created was that they, they were really superficial. Um, in that they, they really looked at a, either a specific prediction problem or they, they looked at the general um, uh, look and feel of the data, like did the first order statistics hold true, like the rate at which you, could, uh, you, you represented a diagnosis or a procedure, was the rate in the synthetic data similar to what you would have seen in the, in the real data. Um, and, and then we also noticed that when you focus on, on EHR data, um, when you focus on all of the EHR data, what ends up happening is you have an overrepresentation of common associations, and it's a reinforcement of the patterns that are in the data, but more rare things kind of fall to the wayside. Um, so, so over time, this notion of GAN-based simulation has has evolved. Um, and so, uh, last year we we published this paper in Jamia that showed how to embed Wasserstein distance functions into, into the simulation process, uh, which allowed you to get a more continuous representation over categorical data, which, which is one of the reasons why it was so tr tricky to adapt GANs to move from images into structured EHR data, because you no longer have like this, this continuous um, pixel representation. Um, we also introduced new evaluation methods that didn't just consider first order statistics, we also considered a lot of the latent dimensionality within the data. So imagine that you did like a principal components analysis over your data, would, would those principal components um, still be similar in the simulated and the original data? In other words, does the topology of the data still look the same? Um, then uh, late last year, we introduced a paper that showed how to embed constraints uh, probabilistically into these types of simulation strategies. Um, for instance, you, you might want to specify up front that you don't ever want to simulate a situation where a woman has prostate cancer. Uh, and, then, and then most recently, a couple months ago, we introduced a paper to, to show how do you actually, how do you move from static profile predictions or simulations to longitudinal or temporal data. Uh, and Khaled was alluding to this with some of their work as well. Um, you, you can think of this as in, embedded long short-term memory models in, into this GAN framework. Okay, so, so what do you do with the data? So we, we never really claimed, and we still don't claim that the data is actually useful for research purposes. It, it may be, but we were, the reason why we went down this path was with the All of Us program had a problem. And that problem was that our engineers needed access to a lot of data, and we wanted to do so in a manner that didn't give them fully identified or even semi-identifiable information. Um, and so this was really meant to support large-scale software development. Um, and so what we did was we, we took data on around 235,000 participants. Um, we trained various scan models off of this data, uh, and, and then we subjected it to various types of constraints so that they could have di different types of data sets for stress testing their system. Uh, and then we, we brought back in various types of outliers that, that were discarded by the system because it was just almost impossible to learn any type of a representation for because the information was too rare. So, so we basically brought it back in at random. Um, and so what, what this allowed people to do was develop all of the tools that they were trying to develop, uh, test system functionality, and then uh, uh, run quality control and, and, and general uh, data assurance tasks. Um, and then, and then it kind of morphed. Uh, we were asked, well, well, could you develop synthetic data sets so that the All of Us program could go out and do demonstration projects around the world? Uh, and so we, we said, we, we think so. And so we took the same principles and um, what, what you've just seen is, is basically we've created environments where we've, we've done about 30 researcher uh, outreach and training events, uh, trained about 2000 users using, using a synthetic data set. Uh, 
Um, and so this was just an example where we were uh, just trying to show general uh, distributions and let people have data that had to look and feel where there was not a formal evaluation here. It was just as it does it look the same and, and the general assessment was yes. And it didn't interfere with any of the trainings that, that had gone on. So everybody seemed to be comfortable with what we were doing. Um, okay, so, so then the, the, the question that keeps coming up over and over again that, that people pose to me is, so, so is synthetic data de-identified? Um, according to the assessment that, that, that Randy talked about earlier, uh, it was determined that it is de-identified, um, but how do you get to such a determination? Um, you know, so if you go back to the way that HIPAA talks about the identification, um, then, then it basically says that, that the information itself does not identify the individual, and there's no reasonable basis to believe that it could be used to identify an individual. And then you're given two approaches for doing so. One is, is this perturb perturbation approach, which says, you know, remove 18 types of identifiers and then say that you have no actual knowledge that the residual information can be used to identify someone. The alternative, which, which Randy mentioned, was, was this expert determination, which says that you're gonna take agreed upon or well agreed upon statistical or scientific principles to show that it's a very, no greater than a very small risk that an anticipated recipient could identify an individual. Um, and then you have to document what, what you've actually done and so that the Office for Civil Rights at, at HHS could come in and investigate what you've done to agree with, with this assessment. Okay, so, what, so what, what could possibly go wrong in this situation? I think we, we, we started to hear a little bit about this, but um, I wanted to just clue you into to, you know, a, a case that's received more notoriety of more recently. So a couple of weeks ago, this, this paper came out in, in MIT's technology review and talked about how AI fake face generators can be rewound to reveal the real faces they trained on. I, I mean, that's a tongue twister, but basically what they're saying is that you can flip these things around if they're, if they're overtrained. As, as Khaled was alluding to. And so there's a, there's a paper that is, that is about to come out uh, by Dong and colleagues that, that shows how to do this in terms of zero shot inversion. Zero, zero shot is really important because what that means is that you don't have the actual, the exact same data as, as what was necessarily even used to, to train the underlying system. This is, this is new information that you're using to probe the system. So how, how does this work? Um, a little bit of an example of what, what the implications are. So what you see here are four images per person. Um, now, the question is, can you tell the difference between them in terms of which was real and which was fake? So, so what you hear, see here is that the, the first image, this is, this is the fake image, and then the other three are all real images that were potentially corresponding to that same person. Uh, and, and in this paper, they, they basically show that the same entity, their images don't look sufficiently similar, so sufficiently di different uh, once the, the simulation has been played out. Now, the, the real question is, you know, is this a problem with the way the simulation was done or have they developed an entirely new way of probing the environment? Um, we'll get back to that in a second. Okay, so, so what I'm telling you is that there's, there's a bunch of things that can go wrong. Um, one is that if you, if you both if you undertrain and overtrain the system, you, you can end up mimicking what's in the original records. Um, and so mimicking is, is a problem uh, because the system may think it's actually simulating, but this is, this is your typical problem with machine learning in general, which is that if it's only seen like one instance and that, 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 that's like it, and there's nothing else in the general and dimensional facility in, in that environment, then it'll, it'll say, okay, well, that's its representative form for that space. And it will just simulate that, that record over and over and over again. Um, now, the thing is, you should be able to simulate the underlying records as long as you can't tell the difference between what's the underlying record and, and what's, what's a fake record. Um, and so this is a problem if you end up generating fake records or re-simulating the real records at a rate that's greater than random. That's, that's the big problem. So you have to test for this potential mimicking problem. Um, the second one is, and Colette alluded to this, has to do with membership inference. And, and this is basically, this is what happens and what, what you were seeing was happening in that previous slide, which is that a user tests if, based on some features it knows about someone, if they're actually in the underlying data that generated the model. Now, this actually requires knowing certain aspects about somebody. 
And, and you must ask yourself the question, is membership inference a privacy intrusion? Right? And, and, and by definition, I, I think you have to say that it is a privacy intrusion because the individual did not agree to disclose the fact that they were a member of a cohort or that they either agreed to be a member of a study or that they were treated at any particular healthcare facility. Um, now, the worst type of situation is when you end up with, with an attribute inference. And, and this is when you can predict features that you didn't necessarily know before about someone based on the features that you do know. Now, you should be able to do general knowledge learning, right? I'm not telling you that if somebody has high cholesterol, you shouldn't be able to predict the fact that they have a good chance of having hypertension, right? The attribute inference in this sense that I'm talking about is when the system ends up retaining knowledge that was not generally accessible. It's the surprise factor, somewhat to, similar to what Khaled was alluding to. And then the real big problems happen when you can combine that membership inference to prove that somebody's in the underlying data set and then perform attribute entrance so that you learn something new about them. So, so this membership intrusion problem, it, it's not new to the synthetic data uh, simulation problem that I'm talking about here. And, and historically what, what's happened is that somebody will take training data, they'll generate a machine learning model, and then you'll take a, a target record and then you'll run it back against the model that was learned from the training data. Now, in this situation, we don't have this ability. And this is where people tend to make claims that the data is sufficiently protected, where they say, look, we have a model, but I'm not gonna show you the model. Instead, I'm gonna show you the synthetic data. And so taking the target record, something you're trying to attack, um, can you flip it back around and say, can I get back to the original training data? And so there, there's ways in which you can do this by saying, can I infer what the generative model was based on the synthetic data itself? And so the more synthetic data that you actually generate, you may actually make it easier to learn what that underlying model is. And if it's idiosyncratic with respect to the underlying records, it makes it easier to probe the underlying system. So just as a, as a quick example of, of how this happened, um, so we have a, this is a paper that's actually under review at the moment. Um, so we, we took data from 45,000 records at, at Vanderbilt. We took their diagnosis and procedure codes. We, we let them have a variable amount of, of information in their records, but we, we truncated it as up to 200 visits. Um, and then we assume that we said, so imagine that the adversary has approximately 10% prior knowledge about, about the patient's information that's going to be disclosed. Um, now, this is what you're looking at here is, is what I call the fully synthetic model where um, you, know, you, you, you don't simulate any, you don't generate any real data that goes out the door. Um, and so what you're looking at here is the number of episodes for the patient, right? Um, and then this is the proportion of the individuals that the adversary targets because they're not gonna be equally successful with every record. And so we're just imagining that they prioritize based on the estimate of the chance that they have successfully completed their attack. And what you should, would see is that the darker the shading here, the more likely it is that the individual could be intruded upon. Um, and so in general, this is relatively okay. Um, the problem that we saw was what happened when you hit partially synthetic data. Now, why would you ever do partially synthetic data? This is actually quite common when people are talking about systems or, or approaches like augmentation, where you're trying to mix synthetic data onto real records to try to make it more useful for prediction purposes. It's actually become a more common uh, phenomenon than, than you might be surprised about. Um, and so there's this assumption that if you generate enough synthetic data and try to hide the real data within the synthetic data, that this will be sufficient for, for protection purposes. And it turns out that this, is, this has the potential to fail spectacularly. Um, and so this is just something that, that we've, been, we've been working through to try to understand under what conditions synthetic data, especially based under the generative adversarial network framework is, is appropriate. Um, okay, so, so what I'm alluding to here is that when you're doing a privacy assessment, context matters a lot. And you really have to define what the expected capabilities of, of the recipients of the data are. And, and that may depend on, on who you're giving the data to. Um, you also need to ensure that your, your assessments consider what the data is showing you, but also how the data was created, um, because you, you should never really assume that, that the simulation strategy is, is unknown to the adversary, especially if they, if they can um, get the same software that you use to generate the data. 
Um, so from general security principles, you should always be able to assume that the simulation process is, is publicly knowledgeable. Uh, and therefore, can you just, you know, using that, can you take the data and invert back to get back to the underlying records? Um, third, you, you also need to consider your, your recipient's tolerance for errors. So Khaled made a great point where he said, so we, we need to have a privacy threshold of 0 0.09. And, and that seems to be where some federal agencies uh, have, have, have hung their hat. Um, it, it's always going to be a question of, uh, is, is that an acceptable level of, of protection? And then finally, uh, we really have to consider society's tolerance for intrusion because, and, and claimed intrusions, because if somebody makes a claim that they've been able to intrude upon a system, that may actually have as much or more damage than even if they were to prove that an individual was, was attackable uh, or any specific record was attackable. Because you might say, I've got a single record that I was successful against. You have a million records that were in your underlying research resource. I guarantee that I can attack all the system, but I'm not gonna do it yet. And I'm just going to try and tell you that you've done something wrong to try to make people change their behavior. That's a really tricky thing to deal with. Okay, so, so I'll stop there. Um, I've probably said more than I should and I'll, uh, I'll open, well, I'm not gonna open anything. I'm just gonna kick it back to Rishi and see where he goes. Great, thanks, Brad. That was a really, really nice introduction. So <clears throat> next, I will briefly uh, go over a couple of slides to tie this back to the Sentinel program, and then we can um, go into the question answer session. So I'm going to try to share my screen, um, Brad. Let me know if you see my slides yet. Yes? Yep. OK, perfect. Great, so thank you uh, to all, all the three presenters uh, today. Um, for for their uh, for the nice introduction to the the relatively new newer methods for synthetic data generation and we at the Sentinel Innovation Center are really excited about this uh, uh, development because uh, in the five year strategy for the FDA Sentinel program which was released 2019 one of the key goals was to enhance scientific uh, community engagement and um, this is really in an attempt to make the existing Sentinel tools readily accessible to external investigators uh, in a data environment that that mimics the uh, mimics the Sentinel data network. Um, and so, uh, as we all know, we use uh, patient level data, uh, whether it be uh, insurance claims or EHRs, uh, which have high uh, uh, sensitive information and so patient privacy remains a, a, a top priority and with the development that we just learned about um, we are really excited about this uh, to to uh, to to implement or, or begin thinking about implementing this type of approaches to achieve the uh, the goal of broader community engagement without compromising patient privacy and the way uh, uh, we have it in in our in our mind in, in the planning phases is 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 what i'm going to briefly talk about today so um, this is uh, the potential use case for for the sentinel where we start with a data asset which is real data that we routinely use for medication safety effectiveness type research. So this includes raw insurance claims data, for example. Um, this could also include uh, structured EHR uh, data, which are linked to the, to the claims for a more granular clinical picture. Um, so in the, in the Sentinel uh, environment, what we first do with these types of data is that they are converted to what is known as a common data model. And this is done to to make sure that we are able to um, to run uh, computable programs or computer programs uh, across the systems with with high fidelity and without with minimum errors, uh, the same programs. And so, so this is for the claim network, for example. This is the Sentinel common data uh, model for the EHRs. This would be something like a PicoNet, which is which is uh, actually in the development phases borrowed heavily from the Sentinel common data model. Uh, and so this is the this is the typical Sentinel type data asset uh, that we have that we use for for competitive safety effectiveness research at the at the Sentinel initiative. Um, now it would be great if more people can access it, but the reality is that there are uh, data use agreement uh, um, uh, restrictions as well as 
um, uh, restrictions imposed by uh, by the data holders, which uh, which makes it impossible. And so that's where we think the uh, technology that that we learned about today could be quite handy. Where in the first step, what we can do is throw the the um, the data asset which uh, contains real data in these synthetic data generators to to create a synthetic data which feel like Sentinel data, but have the privacy protection features uh, intact and uh, are able to meet this high standard uh, through independent review, uh, like, like Randy mentioned, like, like Brad mentioned. And so this um, uh, synthetic data will then have no uh, direct link back to the individual patient level data that, uh, that is used to generate it. And the advantage of doing this is that once you have uh, this type of asset, you can actually make it uh, more widely available, facilitate access to uh, a larger community of investigators. So these are folks who have not yet had the opportunity to engage with the Sentinel program. Um, and the incentive for them is that there is a, a wide range of tools that we have developed over the years. These are quality checked uh, uh, programs that we run all the times, for example, um, that, that can be quite useful for, for, for the uh, community uh, if they are run against a, 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 a data network that looks like the Sentinel data network. And for incentive for us would be that in return, we can hope that uh, there will be new uh, tool development that might take place through this kind of engagement. There may be new uh, methods development that could take place, uh, as well as some preliminary hypothesis generating type studies if we are able to get to a place where we can trust the synthetic data enough through these validation exercises that, that Randy just uh, described and, as well as Khalid. And so um, once we have this broad community engagement, uh, we see a situation where a select group of investigators who propose, for example, most promising methods or, or come up with the most interesting hypothesis generating questions uh, can graduate to this, this higher level of access, which uh, may end up uh, in, in a couple of uh, routes. So, so it is possible that, uh, that at the end of this uh, activity, these, uh, these research questions can be implemented using the, the tools and codes that are developed in this synthetic data environment uh, can be implemented to really any real data um, uh, that, that are converted to the Sentinel um, common data model, for example. Um, so, so this can lead to more, uh, more interesting uh, uh, scientific discoveries. Uh, as well as if the uh, if the in, the research question is interesting enough and we feel like there is um, uh, important discoveries to be made from the synthetic data, we can also uh, let the users uh, have fuller access to granular uh, real data uh, going back to this real environment with higher restrictions, of course, uh, and 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 let them use things like unstructured EHRs, for example, for for things like uh, uh, outcome validation, uh, uh, for, for instance, which which could be quite important important for, for drug safety research. And so the, the whole idea here is to use this technology of synthetic data generation, um, uh, potentially to enable wider access to uh, data that look like Sentinel data in order to facilitate tool development as well as to facilitate science really. Uh, and so this is my one slide. Uh, I would also uh, like to mention that the Sentinel program has prior experience with synthetic data. So for example, 2008 to 2010, 5% Medicare sample had been uh, converted to a uh, Sentinel common data model and posted uh, on the web, web page. So if you haven't checked it out, uh, it's, a, it's a, an interesting, useful resource. So, so that's my last slide. And I will um, hand it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Matini now uh, for the question and answer session. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much, Rishi. And I just uh, uh, want to second that I, I really enjoyed all the presentations and I thought it was a good uh, set of viewpoints. So if ever all the panelists could um, activate their uh, cameras, please, that would be that would be great. So I'm going to do a little bit of synthesis. We've only got about 10 more minutes officially on the session, and I feel like some of the questions are a little bit correlated. So I'm going to try to do a series of three questions uh, to each of you. We'll start, we'll do a Randy Cullid, Brad, and then we'll do some uh, cycling of the first respondents. Um, so the first question I'm, I'd like to ask uh, in that sequence is: so there's a lot of interest from from the um, from the participants on the on this seminar about you know what is the capacity? How far can these data generating processes reach? Is there you know is there is there a capacity for accurate correlation representation in the synthetic data? Um, is there a capacity to actually do uh, causal inference in the synthetic uh, generated data? Um, 
and and so and sort of what are the constraints around the the data products in terms of actual uh, downstream scientific use? So, uh, Randy, Khaled, and then Brad. Sure. So, thank you, Michael, for that question. I I think that um, as long as the data support those types of methods, then the original data then the computationally derived or the synthetic data would be able to as well. And I am going to put in the q and I'm going to type an answer so that it, it shows up, but I'm going to put a link to another paper where we explored some of these questions and some of the, the strengths and limitations. And, and when I say data supporting it, I mean, I'm going back to what I spoke about earlier with respect to the rarity of a particular outcome. I know that what we've seen, um, at least in the MD clone data generation process, we've seen some of that censoring that I mentioned earlier get in the way of being able to study, for example, rare diseases or, or rare outcomes. Thank you. Call it. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are caveats, of course. Um, so let me let me mention a few. Um, first of all, the, uh, the, the the model has to match the data. Um, so let me give you a couple of examples. Um, when we try to model data from a single pair system, um, we have a particular model for that. But when we try to model data, uh, where you have multiple pairs, then then patients uh, you know have come in and out, right? They have different coverage periods and so on. And if your generative model cannot model that, then then you're not going to get good synthetic data. So there has to be a match between the assumptions of the generative model and and the data. Uh, the other example is sequence length. So some types of generative models will work with sequence lengths that have you know three, four, five hundred uh, events per person. But if you're looking at wearable data or device data where a person can have tens of thousands or more uh, events, you know, um, measuring uh, observations every, every second or, or every minute over a long period of time, then modeling those types of sequences is you need a different approach and a different type of generative model. So there has to be either that, that match between the data and the type of model you use, which brings me back to an earlier point. You need a toolbox of models that can be applied to different data sets. They need to have good heuristics to choose the right model for the right for, for the data set you're working with. Uh, and then the the other thing, uh, which was uh, mentioned earlier as well, is is the the um, when you have rare events or rare observations. So rare events are difficult to model anyway, um, and so they are in the context of generative modeling. Is that this the, there may not be enough signal in the data set to capture these these rare events. Uh, if you reduce your data set to be more focused on your cohort or the cohort of interest, then they may not be as rare as if you're trying to model the whole population, for example. So you can handle it that way by being more specific about your cohort. But at the end of the day, uh, the more rare a particular event or a particular observation is, the harder it will be for the generative model to capture that and reproduce that at the, at the output. There are people working on this, and this an active area of research in general and in the context of synthetic data generation. So we may see good solutions to this coming out in the next little while. So I don't think this is a permanent problem, but it's a current one. Thank you very much. Brad? I, I usually don't have anything to add to what Colette has to say. Um, so in, in this situation, there, there's, there's some evidence, there's only a couple things I wanted to point out. Um, there are some scalability issues with these systems, but this is also a problem with most machine learning frameworks in general. Um, I think with our own work, we've stress tested the systems where, you know, a couple of hundred to a couple thousand uh, regressors or independent variables, you, you actually might be able to learn off of that if you have enough data. Um, after that, I, I think it starts to break down. So for instance, there's been some work that has, be, has even tried to simulate genomic information. Um, but beyond a thousand variables, it's it started to break down. Um, so, so I think there's, there's some challenges there in terms of scalability. Um, uh, the, I believe that what Khaled was talking about earlier with respect to hierarchical simulation may actually be a way forward. Um, it may allow you to look for, 
um, stronger simulation, stronger representation of the system or relationships, and then try to be more nuanced. Um, but but also the at least from our own work, what I think has worked really well is that if you you can do conditional simulation as well, where you have an idea of the type of population that you're interested in studying. And so if you focus the learning on, on that population first, before you go generating the data, like you say, these, this is a hypertension population or a T2D population, um, you, you tend to get things that are more representative of them than if you try to learn off over all records all of the time. Um, and, I, and I think that that's, that's something that uh, uh, we're, it hasn't really been sufficiently explored. We don't know exactly where you're supposed to have that break because it's just, it's just, it's an open problem. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I definitely have three more. We're running, um, we're running low on time. I do want to ask this. So the next question I'm going to ask, uh, I'll sequence uh, Khaled, Bradley, uh, Brad, and then uh, Randy. Um, so there's a question around sort of uh, asked both in chat and in the Q&A session around regulatory grade data. And I think what, what the uh, person is interested in is, you know, there's a discussion, obviously, an ongoing uh, between FDA and industry, you know, when you're going through sort of medical product, uh, you know, pre and post-market sort of work. And so the question really relates to, can you use synthetic data in pursuit of the regulatory approval or surveillance uh, process? And if so, how, how, how could that possibly work? So, um, Khaled? Um, well, first of all, it depends what you're using synthetic data for. Um, if you're building machine learning models and then using those in a, in a medical device, for example, then using synthetic data for that. Um, I probably suggest that you validate that on real data uh, before, before submission. Um, and then the other scenario is, uh, you know, one that, that was uh, mentioned as well as the data augmentation scenario where you're simulating, simulating virtual patients in your clinical studies. Uh, so that kind of in silico trials, but with virtual patients, uh, kind of augmenting uh, real patients probably in your control arm. Um, and for both of those, there are existing pathways to start having those conversations like software, uh, software as a medical device, and then in silico trials uh, uh, pathways with, with the regulators. I don't, they're not there yet in terms of accepting synthetic data, but I think there are pathways where these conversations can occur. And I think as the evidence accumulates that uh, the results are comparable, um, but you have to be careful as well. What does comparable mean? Because a lot of discussions we've had so far are around replicating results from real data. But if you're dealing with samples, you have sampling variability and then you have stochasticity from the synthesis. So you really need to make adjustments for that, uh, proper adjustments for that. So assuming you do all of those things, then, then uh, as the evidence accumulates that, that, that you get valid results, um, I suspect that regulatory acceptance will, will increase over time especially for specific things like uh, you know, new indications where you don't have to demonstrate safety or for rare diseases where it's really hard to, to get uh, real patient data. So there may be cases where, where it's easier to get there than, than, than in general, or at least get there first in general. So Thank you. Um, Brad? I'm not touching this one with a 100 foot pole. <laughs> um. Fair no, I, 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 I'm facetious, but, but okay. the, the main reason why I'm facetious is because I don't think anybody can predict what a regulator is going to do or what their requirements are going to be. Um, I think we're, we're still in the same situation with, you know, I, I don't think we completely understand the way that FDA is giving approval with respect to AI clinical decision support. Um, so how exactly this plays out, I, I don't know. But I agree with Khaled in that validation is one thing, um, new proofs of safety or new proofs of, of any finding, I think is gonna be very challenging to get across the table to FDA with, with synthetic data. My suspicion is that it's going to be a hypothesis generating strategy where you're then gonna be required to test it with some real data. Yeah, thank you. Um, Randy? Yes, I was just going to add on to that. Um, one of the themes in what I hope I got across in my presentation was that we're, we don't stop doing the validation. So particularly with some of these more, um, you know, more rare outcomes, 
that we would be looking for using synthetic data. We would need to continue to do the, the statistical validation. And also, I think that there could be a moving target as to you know, what questions we're supposed to be able to answer with these data. So I, I can't imagine that this process would be um, a, a real um, clear one. I would think that it would have to be kind of renewed over time as new questions come up. Great, right, thank you. Um, I know we're nearly at the time, but I wanna take moderator's privilege to ask a question that I know uh, Sentinel uh, will really uh, want, want to hear. So it's kind of a two-parter. We'll go Brad, uh, Randy, and Khaled. Um, so one is, you know, a lot of the data generating processes that you're talking about generate more of an analytic flat file or generate like a derived subset of data that really don't fully represent like the granular execution of an electronic health record like Cynthia or some of the other things. Um, you know, in as much as Sentinel is trying to represent its data in a common data model, it has sort of a breakdown representation that may not reflect a DGP process, but you still have to be able to reconstruct uh, an analytic file to be able to do the work that you're doing. What are the capacity of the tools out right now to be able to sort of migrate that sticky wicket? And then the other corollary to that is, um, how easy it is to inject signal on top of these synthetic data for like if you want a device or a vaccine or a medication and you want to generate an adverse event or a medical device adverse event, how easy it is to layer on signals and still maintain your data correlation structure. So um, uh, Brad, uh, uh, you're, you're first. Oh my God, Michael, you, these are like, <laughs> this is like the hardest question of the day. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's a simple, I don't know if there's a simple I didn't expect there to be one. Yeah, I mean, it's a, so let's, let's, let's do them in reverse. How difficult is it to build signal on top of synthetic data? Um, you know, I think the question is how difficult is it to simulate a biosurveillance related event on top of real data? And it's really only as good as you understand how well to model that event. So th this is a problem that, that it's been studied for decades. Um, you can do synthetic, um, events. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. It can be done. Um, do we have tools for currently doing that? I'm, I'm not aware of tools that, that currently do that in, in this situation. Could it be, could it be created? Pretty sure it could be created. Um, Thank you. The, the other issue, um, actually, given that we're almost out of time, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. Um, Randy? Thank you, Brad. I won't add on to your sim simulation answer, but I will address um, the, I guess, the limitations of losing, if you will, that data model um, using a synthetic data generation platform. And I'm most familiar, you know, full disclosure, I'm most familiar with MD Clone. And we are able to compare the synthetic file to the original data file that can both be generated from MD clone and they're in the same framework. Um, again, a flat file, but you only get the variables that you've requested be computationally derived. So you don't get the entire wide data file that comprises the, the EHR. Thank you. And I appreciate everyone's forgiveness of a uh, uh, forgiveness for a few minutes. Uh, Khaled? Yeah, I'll just I'll just touch upon the inject data injection. Uh, so if you are using copulas for synthetic data generation, it's very easy to do because you can just add more distributions to your copula. And if uh, as Brad mentioned, if if you uh, if you know what you want to model. You know, if you know your your uh, essentially your covariance between your added variables and everything else in your data, then you can put those in your in your uh, uh, model uh, and just define a copula with with your additional variables and run a simulation with new data. Uh, and actually, in, in in our book that we wrote on this on the topic, we we discussed uh, adding simulating additional data sets in, in the context of using of using you know in our case we use Gaussian copulas for that. Okay. Um, so, so that that's straightforward to do in in that case, but you need to know what the correlations are. Like you have to know, you have to understand the phenomenon enough to put realistic correlations in there. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that's okay. Um, um. Well, I just, I, I personally want to thank each of you very much for uh, for coming in and giving a presentation. I'll hand it back to Rishi for final comments. 
Great, thank you. Thank you everyone again for a really fascinating set of presentations and lot, lots for us to think about. Um, and yeah, I, I, I have a feeling this won't be the last time we'll be talking about this, this issue. So, so thank you again for your time and expertise and uh, thanks everyone for joining and, and, and uh, for, for this uh, 90 minute session. I will see you, see you next time. 95. 95. <laughs> thanks. Thanks guys. Talk to you later.